In this episode, we're going to take a look at the user interface and get familiar a bit more in depth here what's happening. To this side here, we have tools and different ways to interact with Mari. We have dropouts here or expandable. If I go into one of these, you see this little arrow and we can see here we have uh, different uh, painting tools, blur and, and vector painting. We had paint through. So that's a way like essentially like you can paint with images, almost like you painting on an invisible pane of glass and then you project it onto the object. There's gradients so like this, clone stamp. If you want to clone something, you can, for example, from there to there. We have different type of ways to warp paint. So what do I mean by that? So if I do this, I can now go in here and, for example, take this slurp brush and start to manipulate paint before you project it down. So that, that's, a, that's a way you can interact with paint. You also have the different warp and the two brushes. So we're going to go more in depth in tools later on. This is just a very quick rundown here. You have here marquee select, for example, here. I don't use it that often, but you can limit where you can paint. For example, now you can only paint within this border here. Transform paint buffer. Yeah, I, I don't really use that one that often. A vector inspector. I use it a few times and you can essentially paint directions, flow maps and directions of, of vectors. The paint dropper here or the, the color picker, you pick colors on screen, obviously. If you hit the P button, you get uh, painting. The shortcut, the C button, color picker. P is the shortcut for paint brush. This one here is essentially background and foreground colors. If you want to reset this, for example, if I hit C here and then hit X and C and pick another, you see now we have essentially these two colors, but you want to have black and white. The shortcut for that is D. Then you reset it back to black and white and swapping between foreground and background color is the X button to get there, okay? We, we have here different patch object and face selection modes. An object, if I hit this one, it will select the whole object. If I hit this one patch, it will take a selected UV patch or UDIM. If I hit face, it will select faces. You can double click to auto complete that selection. As I mentioned in an earlier episode, you can also set here connected UV, connected mesh and some angles, for example. And you can grow here and shrink and all that. So I encourage you to go through all of these modes and see what happens there. This one here, I don't really use this that often because I don't really use layers and channels, but this is mostly related to channel and layer workflows. I use the no graph, but for example, if you go here, looking here at my, if I hit the I button here, I get this pop out. Uh, I can take current channel, base color, base. If you go here to layers, I'm just going to make a few layers. Uh, I'm just going to dock this, make a, a cloud. So we have a cloud on top of my paint. And essentially here, this mode here, current layer and below. So now I'm looking at the cloud layer. But now if I select the, the base here, you see now when I have this mode layer and below, it will only look at this, this layer and below. But if I now hit the cloud, it will look at this layer and below. So this is mainly used for the layer stack. More on that later as well. The next one here, we have different ways to look at the objects in different type of shading. So this one is flat shaded and just going to be purely the textures. We have the basic, you get some shadowing. Basic with shadows. Let's take and turn off some of these lights so we can see here. You can see here I actually get self-shadowing from the objects here when I have shadows. Then we have full and that's going to be uh, with uh, specular contribution. Full with shadows. Uh, again we get some shadowing from the, the light there. You need to have some uh, settings here. You need to have render shadows onto the light itself. For this to work for example if I enable this one. Rendering. You can see here, you need to have this checkbox and it also needs to be enabled here in the preferences. There's a global setting that I usually turn off, by the way, shadow maps allowed, because 
whenever you have this enabled, it takes a bit of resources from Mari and um, Usually I don't really use these direct lights. I usually use an HDR and HDRs can't produce shadows anyway. So I just turn it off to save some resources. This is for objects that's essentially, it wouldn't work so good on this one because this one is not symmetrical at all. It's, it's from a, like a scan essentially, but you can um, on an object that actually has symmetrical paint mirror painting here. We can see it here anyway. As you see here, you see the center line. My object is not on the center line. It tries to paint symmetrical still. Obviously it will be uh, somewhat limited on this geometry because it's, it's not symmetrical. You can have mirror X, Y, and Z. So that's different planes. This is another type of mirroring. It doesn't take the object into account. This is solely mirroring onto the paint buffer it itself here. I'm just going to clear this. Speaking of clearing paint, I use the control shift C command to do that as a shortcut, but you can also hit this button to do that. Yeah. So th this one here resets the paint buffer. And what is the paint buffer then? Let's take a look at the paint buffer tool. Where is it? Here, so if I hit the Z button and zoom out, we can see here, essentially, this is the paint buffer. And this is the area where we can paint. You can see here, I can't paint outside of this paint buffer. So when I do anything here, essentially like painting on, on a, a sheet of glass, and when I hit the, the, the B, it bakes it down. One, if you have zoomed out like this and you wanna reset it, so, you essentially, so it encompass essentially the whole object, you can hit this one and now it reset it. So essentially goes back. And now if I zoom it somewhat further, you can see now it's essentially reset. We can zoom in and hit this one. And now it's reset for this. I'm going to go more into projection and painting and, and paint buffers later on. Just mentioning that it's there. The top menu and uh, uh, some of these buttons here as well. So some of them here, you can see here, now I have the select tool enabled and you get the contextual menu here. If I switch this over to the paint tool, you can see it changed here. So S, that's that's the way for selections. And you can see here, it looks different. It has options for this tool, the paint tool, the paint through tool. All of these will change here somewhat depending on what tool you have. So you have tool specific options here. Some of these here is more related to, for example, the different views here you see here we are orthographic but if i for example would uh, hit this the uv camera here you see now i have two uv views essentially i can go back here to let's see which one is the orthographic that this one this is perspective orthographic so if you manage to for example change your orthographic camera to UV view, you can reset it there. This one is essentially orthographic and UV view at the same time. If you want to look at an object and also, for example, maybe you want to paint something here in the UV view, but you want to see it onto the object, you can do that. Going back to the orthographic, that's about it. You have some focal view here for the, the perspective camera and so forth. And then you have all of these menus here. And some of these here, actually doubles a bit here and there in the user interface and tabs and they share a connection between the two some of it you can in most places you can actually access most of the stuff either by right clicking or by operating these tabs here so i rarely actually go up here and do stuff from the menu you kind of have most of it accessible anyway but yeah it's good to know essentially the file here is obviously saving closing and quitting and you can also here go to settings and inspect for example what what type of color management you started a project with this one is probably the one of the few exceptions where i actually go in a lot the preferences obviously when you want to tweak your preferences you can uh, get some additional speed by leveraging some of these settings mainly in the GPU and, and all of that. So we can make a separate tutorial about that. Essentially, the HUD manager can be good to, for example, enable FPS in your HUD. Where is my HUD? 
So here's the HUD. I accidentally had turned it off. And now you can see here, now it prints out uh, how many FPS and stuff. And you can configure your HUD here by going in here and ticking uh, different stuff. The GPU might be interesting, like max memory and stuff. The canvas FPS is something that I, I encourage you to enable. It's good to have a, a look at like if you start to get very low on FPS, you, you know that you need to do something about optimization. Selection here is mostly regarding like selection like this and different modes. Objects, it's mainly object related. If you want to add an additional objects, you can have multiple objects. Uh, you can have locator that's essentially like a locator that is connected to the object. I don't really use that that often because locators in Maurice it has more to uh, to wish for, uh, uh, if I put it that way. Ambient occlusion is something that I calculate and uh, subdivide uh, the object. Channels, almost all of this you can do either by right clicking or from the channels tab here as well. But yeah, it's you can copy and paste and convert and, and all of that. I will have a separate tutorial about channels and layers. And here is very closely related to channels is layers. And obviously here, for example, a channel is essentially housing multiple layers. If I put it very simplified and layers here, if I dock my layers, it's like Photoshop. You have the base layer. You can add another layer here and start to essentially paint on top and then you can go in here and say, no, I, I don't like that. You can uh, remove op opacity or you can start to to mask out, remove and, and, and it's like an alpha mask. So this is layer based. If you use Photoshop, you should be pretty familiar with layers. Some of the commands that you can do here, you can also do here by right clicking, etc. So yeah, same here with patches. A lot of the stuff you can do here, almost all of it you can do here by essentially here by patches, right click and uh, copy paste. Ptex, don't really use Ptex uh, very few times. It's a bit convoluted workflow to say the least, because for example, if you update the geometry, all of a sudden everything stops to work and you need to transfer and do a lot of work. So Ptex I have never really used and it's very rare that in VFX we use Ptex because we do so many changes. UVs is still very much adopted. Shading, this is, you can add shaders, but you can also do it from here. Uh, painting, never really. Uh, all of this is controlled by shortcuts, essentially. Filters, sometimes you can use filters, but nowadays with bake point filters, some of it, this is kind of made obsolete. Uh, camera operations, and all of this is also sh key shortcut driven here. One, two, three, four different uh, modes for orthographic camera shortcuts etc. You have it here. This one, sometimes I go into default layout or uh, for example, if I go to default layout, see this is essentially how Mori looks like when you started the first time. Python, sometimes you get a Python command or you want to see if something has broken and you get the request by a TD. Can you give me the Python printout? This is where you go to, but you also have it here. Python console, there you go. This one, Nuke, I don't really use the Nuke bridge. And I think non-commercial, this is not even available. Help, Foundry Online help. You can uh, essentially here use a guide, get some information. So yeah, that's, that's good to have. Yeah, so that's kind of the top row on this side. Essentially already mentioned, a lot of this has already we've gone through already, but channels, essentially you can, uh, if you work in channels and layers, you create a channel and that channel house layers, essentially. So you have the color channel, you have the bump, you have the roughness and the specular channel. They are all containing different layers. This one, the color picker here, this is where you can pick colors. When I click this one, it pops out. And when I go away, it's, it essentially disappears. But you can also choose to either here go in and, and pin it. So now it's staying there. You can also, if I unpin it, you can hit this one. And now if I hit color here, it will stay there until I hit colors again. That's up to you. You can either have this unpinned. As soon as you essentially leave the area of the tool or the panel, it will disappear. History review, 
Yeah, you can actually go back in time here, go from different states here. I don't really go go that granular. Maybe I control Z a few times. Image manager, this one is where you will load images. For example, you have reference images or textures you want to paint. You load them in and then you can drag them in. For example, here I have a few textures here. And you can see here I dragged it in and now it becomes a paint through tool. So I can start to paint with this. So you, you load them in, then they are available to either use as uh, brushes or materials or whatever. The layer here, I'm just going to take this away so we can see here more clearly here. This is where you can add layers. For example, here, I want to take this away and add another layer. Start to say that we want to add some, some of this, these textures here on, on top and it doesn't repeat. So yeah, we have to take care of that. I can paint this and then I can with the layer, if I go back here, we can start here to modulate this by different layers here or different blending modes. So let's say that we want to do some multiply some of these effects here on top to break this up or do an maybe an overlay is probably more appropriate for this to get some some break up on, on top here. So so this is how you can essentially use layers. It's probably qu convenient to start with layers, but I encourage you to look at the no graph as soon as possible, because this is no graph is where all of the power in Mario comes from. Lights, you saw me operate lights a bit before. It's you can you can load here or enable different lights. You have four like kind of lights you can um, operate like this with this ball. If you turn all of the lights off, it becomes flat shaded, but you also have an environment light. So if I turn this on, you can see here, it's now lit by an HDR instead. The mode render one, I don't really use this one, but you can actually render channels into an image and you can also bake textures. It's usually super slow. So I hope in upcoming Mario versions, we get a better bake engine. It's about time now, I think. We can get something similar to Substance Painter. Node Graph, this is where you wanna, you see everything we've done here essentially has its own layer here. And some of the operations here we see here, when I go into my layers, let's say I add a few paint nodes, we can see here Mario is building the graph for us and it becomes quite messy, but you can lay out this. For example, if I hit this one, this is the, the top channel and I hit the, the L button, it will start to lay out all of these layers that I created here. And now if I delete them, you will see they will also disappear from this, the layer stack. When you build with an O-graph, I encourage you to build it from scratch because Mari, when you build it, I mean, you start to essentially add stuff to an auto-generated, quite messy. So I encourage you to learn how to build in the no graph from scratch rather than some kind of hybrid workflow where you start with channels and layers and then go to no graph. Better to build it from scratch. Objects, something we looked at in the last episode, so I'm not gonna go through that. I can link in the video description to that episode. Painting, this is usually something that you go in and, and tweak some of the different properties essential bake behavior i encourage you to play with uh, some people like to have like i do essentially i can paint but then i can slide around the object and i don't bake it down directly but if you go here to bake behavior auto bake and clear if i tumble the viewport it essentially project it down almost like it's painted onto the geometry directly. I don't like that behavior because I usually want to, for example, go in and tweak the paint with these slurps and toe brushes and stuff. And then it's very easy that you accidentally bake down the paint before you actually get into the, the deformation brush, for example. So therefore I'm used to having it to clear only. For example, here paint, I can take my time and, and micro adjust. Go in here, set this, let's drag around. Once I'm happy, I hit the, the B button and then it bakes down and, and that works better for me. You have different type of masking here. You can see here you get, for example, here, you, this is typical masking 
that you can get away with masking. You have a shortcut for this. You see here now I have edge mask on. And if I hit the G button, you can see here. And when I hit the G button, you can see you get the feathering here and you can go in here and actually tweak how much it will mask away here. So this is good when you do paint directly onto the object and you don't want to have this streaking pattern. So if I bake down now, you're essentially going to get the soft transition instead of this streaking. So you can now tweak the border edge here onto the maskings. But yeah, I'm going back to masking and, and this uh, when we get there. Yeah, it's good to know that uh, you have brush specific masking. You also, if you, for example, have a paint uh, through image, you can actually go in here and grade before you uh, project it. So for example, you can multiply, you can also go in here and, and, and grade it with a curve like this uh, to actually tweak the image before it's even applied to the paint buffer. That could be good to know, but you need to enable this to be able to do that. Patches, don't re really use it that often. I, I do any patch related stuff by shortcuts or selecting it here in the viewport directly. So yeah, projectors, this is a way you, you can store cameras and import cameras. So let's say that you want to go back to exactly this location here. You can say create a projector. Now if I tumble around here and say, oh, I want to go back to ex exactly that projector location, you can say make projector current and it snaps back. But you can also export this out as a essentially file that you can then paint in another program and bring back in and it will automatically reproject onto this exact uh, location. So you can do stuff in Photoshop, bring it back and uh, reproject it from this camera. So it's kind of like a, a tool that also is used for importing cameras, for example, from Maya project from um, like camera projections and stuff. Python console mostly looking at this if something goes wrong or if there's an error I'm trying to see here if i get printouts that doesn't make sense I can send it to support collection groups this is different geometry specific potential selections that came with the object when i ported it you essentially this is the different groups and hierarchy uh, so you can use this to isolate certain parts, for example. Shaders here, for example. Now I'm looking through the principal BRDF. Let's say that I make this metallic, for example. You can see here now it starts to look like it's a metal object uh, rather than a uh, regular painted object. So this is a way to get preview. And you can also load different I other like vendor shaders like Arnold, 3D Lite. For example, if you want to use the random shader, you need to download it from Pixar and install it. It doesn't come with Mari, but it's available. Shelf. Yeah, so essentially this is a collection bin for brushes, materials, anything that uh, you want to use. For example, you can load into different uh, categories here. You can add a new shelf my own you can start to import items you want to import let's say that we want to import all of these splatter images here yeah so you double click and it loads into the image manager and then you can drag it in uh, and start to use it so it's yeah you can build your own library of stuff snapshots don't really use this but essentially you can save states i have never i, I used it in the beginning uh, it's a bit strange workflow, to be honest. Texture sets, if you have mega scan, you can point it to a uh, mega scan location and it will go through. And essentially, you can get all of these materials here. Let's say that you want to, let's say dirt, you want to say add to image manager and it will load it here into the image manager and you can start to use it. Tool properties, this is depending on what what type of tool there you can have tool specific settings here for example have a paintbrush or a, a paint through tool you will see that the settings and all of these uh, values that you can go in and modify are going to change depending on what, what type of tool you you have so that's kind of the the sidebar and now the last here is this bar here the main thing here, this one I don't really use that often, but you can lock here, for example, pan. So now I can only pan in one axis. Now I can pan all. 
you can zoom, enable or disable. So when I lock down the being able to zoom, like I could there, um, if I disable it, I can't zoom. So maybe that's good if you want to be on this, you want to make sure you can't zoom in. I, I, I don't really use this that often. This one is a bit, yeah, you can have snapping. So if I control R, will rotate your camera. And this is, I guess, snaps every 40, 90 or 45. I don't use it. So shift control R, you can essentially rotate your camera around its own internal Z axis. This one, not really using that often, but this one here uh, could be good to have an eye on. This is color management, and I will go through this more in depth in other episodes. But essentially, you have a, uh, a, a view transform that will change either from this color and set it to a raw, depending on what type of data you're looking at. For example, if you color data, you will have a LUT, and a LUT is essentially a lookup table that will make this one look good for this screen here. But if I would go here and hit the I button and go to my channel and go to another channel, for example, roughness here, you see here now it turned Essentially, you can see that the view mode changed here to a scalar representation and essentially also turn off the LUT. And that is because we are looking at scalar data. So scalar data is essentially a value usually between 0 and 1. For example, roughness is usually between 0 and 1, where 1 would be a very rough object and 0 would be it's like a mirror. If I go back to my color channel, it will switch it back and it becomes an sRGB lot. If you're using a commercial one, you might have ACES and it will have different type of LUTs available here that makes more sense for your monitor. You also have these sliders here where you can overcrank exposure and, and gamma, for example, uh, if you want to do some testing or uh, troubleshoot something. I uh, usually go to exposure and gamma just to, for example, inspect masks and, and these type of things. Yeah, so that's kind of uh, the whole Mari interface in a nutshell. And that was a lot of things to ingest. I hope you're not sleeping at this time. In the next one, I will deal with channel and layers. Essentially starting this project here with channel and layers. After that, I will take this into the node graph. So we'll see how that works as well. Happy painting.